Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Steve. You're going to have to put up with me for the whole lecture. And we're going to talk about low arousal. Feel free to ask any questions. Just save the difficult ones to the end. Um, low arousal, what do we mean by low arousal? Well, I suppose um, one of the, the, the things that most people talk about and on any training course people will talk about uh, in any incident is keep calm. Keep calm? Believe me, you're anything but calm when you're getting a chair heading towards you. When the fire extinguisher is being bounced off your head, you're anything but calm. What we really mean there is appear calm. At least give the external appearance of being in control because your heart rate will be going about 400 beats to the dozen in those sorts of situations. Most staff freeze, panic. Yeah, you've got to kind of remain in control of your own senses, be aware of what's going on. The other element I suppose that most people will be told is don't pour fuel on the fire. Don't make the situation any worse than it already is. There's nothing worse than going, going up to... I said, no, no, I said one, no, oh. And it happened for no apparent reason. Well, you could have probably have written a small book on what had gone wrong in that situation. So what sort of things, what sort of elements actually cause people to get their heart rates going? Let's have a couple of volunteers. Couple of, come on then, let's have a volunteer. Yep. Grab a partner. <coughs> Thank you. Right, because what I'd like you to do is just, that's it, without, without talking, mm -hmm. without laughing. Always fatal when I say that. Don't talk, don't laugh. All I want you to do is just turn and face each other. Don't talk, don't laugh. Don't talk, don't laugh. You have to look at each other. Just look at each other. Don't talk, don't laugh, just look. Just look at each other. Don't talk, don't laugh. Now just go toe to toe, or as close to toe to toe as you can get. Don't talk, don't laugh, just look at it. Now what I want you to do is just stare. Just don't talk, don't laugh, just stare. Keep on staring, don't talk, don't laugh, just stare. Just stare, keep on staring. <laughs> don't talk, don't laugh, keep on staring. Now just put your hands on each other's shoulders. Just put your hands on the shoulders. Don't talk, don't laugh, keep on staring. Keep on staring, keep on staring. Don't talk, don't laugh, keep on staring. Give them a little shake. Just give them a little shake. Don't talk, don't laugh. After three, I would like you to shout no. One, two, three. No. 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 Okay, and you can rest. Sit back down. Thank you. Just give them a... <laughs> now... What you may have noticed there, of course, is there was just a little bit of laughter. So, my guess is having seen that, as you both laughed, you must have both enjoyed that and we should do that activity ten times a day. And of course, how often do we hear staff where you will see a client run up to something... <laughs> he knew what he was doing. He enjoyed that. And of course, it's a very inappropriate emotion, isn't it, that's coming out of that point. Yeah, not enjoyed it at all. But of course, the other thing that we learned from there, when I said, don't talk, don't laugh, Hi. what did he do? <laughs> Kept laughing, talking. Yeah, it's a bit like, don't push the red button. You pushed the red button, didn't you? And yet, how many times, you know, we have a, an individual we support here. Uh, I, I was supporting you yesterday um, on shift. You hit me yesterday. And I come on shift this morning. We're going to be friends today. You're not going to be hitting me, are you? What have I just implanted? Yeah. Just a thought. Just like at the moment, none of you at the moment are thinking of pink elephants. Don't, whatever you do, think of pink elephants. Especially the pink elephants with the blue spots. Yeah, don't think of the pink elephants with the blue spots. 
And of course we do it all the time, don't we? There's lots of things we say. Anybody that's been to a restaurant, the waiter comes in with a hot plate. Don't touch the plate, it's hot. What do you do? Ah, wasn't really hot. Don't touch the wet paint. So if it's not wet the first time, you have another go, don't you? <laughs> Just to make sure, oh look, it's wet! Don't walk on the grass. Well, <laughs> of course we do. Yeah, so just got to be aware, isn't it, in terms of those situations, how we're actually communicating with people. So what did I do there? What was the first thing that I did there to start the, the heart kind of going? Because that's what tends to happen when adrenaline's starting to kick in. Your heart rate's going up. What happens to your breathing rate? Starts to go up. Your skin conductivity increases as you get sweaty, sweaty palms, you know, and I've seen people in that absolutely dripping. It's like they've put their hands in a bucket of water because of the level of, of arousal there. So the first thing I got you to do, invasion of personal space, wasn't it? We know from work where people have sat down on park benches and they send another subject over to sit on the park bench next to them. What will the people do? They'll move further along the park bench, walk off, or sometimes just turn around and hit the person. Get off, you're too close. You see this on flights all the time. You know, people trying to, to sit in where there's no space next to them, you know, or sit rather where there is a space <laughs> next to them. You see it on trains, buses. I would certainly have individuals on a bus where in order to create a big personal space around them, they would put a couple of bags in front seats in front of them, maybe a hat on this seat over here, and just the coat and brolly behind. So they get all that personal space yeah, to themselves. You start to encroach upon it, yeah, you start to get worried. And we can show that. Um, yeah, can I borrow another, let's have another volunteer, a willing victim. Yeah, willing victim. Good. Thank you. Because... I'm in the old discotheque, <laughs> night, <laughs> nightclub to you guys, yes, maybe ballroom for you, okay, we don't know each other, yeah, we're just in this night, nightclub, if you're just this way, we're busy dancing, we're boogieing away, all the modern trends, <laughs> as you do, and all of a sudden, hello, what's your name then? Uh, yeah, you can see the step away there, so you <laughs> sit down, yes. You can see in those situations how people yeah, move apart. And we said, I'm sure um, you're all fairly young. I'm sure that your uh, grandparents will have had bolster pillows. Anybody know what a bolster pillow is? No. Bolster pillow was the long pillow that went right the way across the double bed. Oh, yeah, oh, it's all coming back. When you were young, you remember it now, staying at your grandparents. It went right across. When they had an argument, straight up the middle. Woe be tired if you crossed that space. You need one of them. All right, yes, okay. You wouldn't be the first. But, of course, when we're looking at this space, and, you know, sometimes if you have an argument with your partner, you may not want them in the same county as you, let alone the same house we have ways, and similar with our individuals that we support. The personal space is very important. You may have some people who's uh, got no concept of your personal space whatsoever. They come up right in your space. And you see people in that situation there, you'll hear staff in the back of it, just will you back off? Back off. You can hear them starting to get aroused there, particularly if people are tending to shadow you quite a lot all the time. So personal space is quite a, 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 an element to think about. It makes sense, doesn't it? And if you're invading somebody's personal space, you're likely to get hit, particularly if the person doesn't know what it is you're intending to do. I see it quite a lot where you'll have, to, oh, there we go, now just come, there, that's better, isn't it? Well, did you know what I was going to do? Did you want me to do it? Could you have done it yourself? Yeah. It would have made sense for me to give you maybe 
you know, give you the choice, give you a little process time in order to get that done yourself. Personal space. What was the next thing that I got you guys, you willing volunteers, to do? Get closer, so really start to put you under a bit of stress, a bit of pressure there. And then the eye contact. Now, we know eye contact's extremely arousing, don't we? Let's borrow... Yes, I think you'll be ideal for this one. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Actually, yeah. Mm. Gymnast, you're, a, yes, you're a bit bigger than I thought as well, because it's just like... <laughs> yes, because if you just turn around facing me, yep, this way, and just make a fist like this. Because we see this, don't we, very often um, with the boxers. Yeah, because they, they end up the staring, the eye contact. And of course, what happens after a few seconds? They bo yeah, you better sit down before I have you. <laughs> yes. We'll use you next time. Um, we, we see that arousal levels go way up, don't we? The eye contact is absolutely enormous, arousing. People say, oh, it's all for the camera. They're doing it for the camera. It's all part of the publicity. Well, certainly the first bit is, but I can't believe people are willing to bruise knuckles when they've got a multi-million dollar fight in a day or two's time. It's crazy, isn't it? And certainly on some of them, you'd see the security joining in as well. Really helpful. So eye contact. Now I remember, I don't know whether anybody's come across Desmond Morris. Anybody heard of Desmond Morris? He wrote books, the old books, uh, Man Watching, I think it's now called People, People Watching. You know, and I, I remember seeing Desmond Morris in, in a zoo uh, staring at chimpanzees and absolutely sending them ape up through the roof, all over the cage. And I was probably about 13 at the time. And I remember thinking, well, what a great experiment. Now, my auntie had a Chihuahua Pekingese dog thing. And I thought, well, OK, we'll stare at this little monster, this little beast. After about a minute, its eyes went completely wide its pupils dilated. It was like a cartoon character with its eyes popping out of its head. It's brilliant. 13 years old, I'm doing all this. And then, like a set of curtains, its eyes suddenly became very bloodshot, like Hound of the Baskervilles. And the thing leapt from my neck. Now I'm 13, so I'm staying really calm, shouting things like, kill it, kill it. <laughs> yeah, my auntie said, ooh, it's never done anything like that before. Just kill it. Yeah, it shows the arousal levels, you know, with anybody can go in. And I, you know, I know if I've, there's a six foot six Hal's angel staring across the bar at me, I could be in a bit of trouble. So can we reduce the level of eye contact? People give you all sorts of ways of, of, of avoiding eye contact. Look at the point on the forehead. You know, the individu individual thinks, do I have a spot there? Look over the shoulder. You see the person spend all the time going, what are you looking at? Look at the third button down. Usually find that gets me slapped in pubs. <laughs> yeah, really the main thing is, is about being aware of what it is you're doing. There's nothing worse than avoiding eye contact, uh, eye contact altogether. Because it's another element I think a lot of staff fall foul of is the fact that you don't listen with your eyes. And I think a lot of clients that I would come across would be like this, but they're still hearing what people are saying. Useful to think about at handovers, <coughs> Yeah, and around sharing confidential information, just because the individual isn't looking at you, doesn't mean to say they're not taking it all on board. So eye contact, very important. Do not get into the transfixed horror movie gaze. You're likely to get problems. And then, after the eye contact, what else did I get you guys to do? The touch, wasn't it? The, the, the touch. This was just the, the final element to really start to get the heart rate kicking in, the adrenaline kicking into the system. Um, you see this on, on things like um, police camera action kind of programs, where as soon as the police officer goes hands on, everything goes off big time, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a great wrestling match at that point. Yeah, and it's very similar, similar to what you see in situations where staff go hands on with the individuals they support. That's just the final element. The problem is with that, is that if I'm borrowing, can I borrow you, you, you as, a, as a, an individual we're supporting at the moment? I 
I tell you, you did that better than he did. Yeah, we'll see this if you're a, a client, if you're the individual we're supporting, you'll see stuff trying to reassure. It's, it's okay, it's all right, it's okay. What have I just done? Touched, eye contact, and I've invaded personal space. And you wonder why you, you get a whack. Yeah, so we've got to be very careful, haven't we? Touch can be seen as a sign of warmth, a sign of security. It can also be seen as a sign of hostility. How many times have you, with your own partners, a little bit of a tiff, and you, you go up to the partner to give him a hug. Get off me! Don't touch me! <laughs> yeah? And then, when you've calmed down, in about a week, <laughs> when you've calmed down in about a week, you say, what's the matter now? You haven't given me a hug. So they've got to give me, it's too late now! <laughs> Cheers, thank you. So that touch is going to be on our terms when we want it. And when somebody is already pretty aroused, it's not the greatest thing in the world to be doing. I wouldn't be recommending going hands-on with people unless you really know the person well and they're at lower levels of arousal. The other things, I suppose, is what, was, what did I get you to do next? Shaking. Shaking, good, well remembered. Shaking, I don't do that because I have a lot of people, a lot of staff that will kind of play fight with individuals. A bit of a play fight, a little bit of a kind of element, and then you get to a stage, where, okay, enough now. Trouble is, the service user, the client, can't come down. They go on up. An incident entails, ensues, and what gets written in the incident book? Happened for no apparent reason. Well, it did, it's because you've wound them up. Now, you may be perfectly all right going into that WWF wrestling situation, but then you go away on a week's holiday. And it's me and him that have to cope. We're being bounced off all four walls. So we've got to be quite careful in those situations. What are we actually implementing? How are we actually implementing it? I guess the other thing to think about as well is, yeah, well, what do we do next after the little wrestling match? Well, shouting. shouting, yeah, the shouting. Um, I go into places noisier than an airport runway. CD blaring away in one corner, TV blaring away in another corner, DVD blaring away in another corner, a couple of staff blaring away in another corner, nobody listening to any of it. It is noisier than an airport runway. Can we bring the noise down? Anybody been to a kid's party? Yeah? Recently? No. Um, not no, not recently. You haven't get crashed any kids' parties recently. Okay. Well, yeah, the kids are here, noise level. You try and shout above them. Where do the kids go? <laughs> Next level up. Yeah, can we bring the noise levels down? It doesn't help anybody screaming, particularly those individuals that are hypersensitive already. Yeah, bring the overall noise levels down. And I guess that brings us on to the communication that we're actually seeing or actually using with the individuals particularly in terms of high arousal, high stress for clients, can we reduce the verbal right the way down? You know, anybody that does any coaching, I think there's a coaching principle, the KISS principle. People come across the KISS principle. It in the last lecture. Keep it simple, stupid. I change it slightly. Keep it short and simple. Yeah. Nobody likes to be called stupid. I'll just keep it short and simple. So, in terms of keep it short and simple, um, it may be that somebody's perfectly able to have a perfectly okay conversation with you when they're calm. When they get stressed, sometimes they're looking to get one word out. I uh, would be working with uh, a particular individual that would quite comfortably speak three languages. Tell you anything you want to know about any ancient history, superb encyclopedic knowledge of ancient history, but when they get stressed, you'd have to wait 30 seconds for them to answer, and then it would be a single word answer. Usually no. Yep. So we have to adjust our language accordingly, not overburden that. Keep it short, keep it 
with its simple language. It's no good using prolific, profuse use of English vocabulary if a person can't understand it. There may be some sort of visual point of reference to actually help you in that. Anybody that's been nervous, what happens to the speed of your voice? It gets quicker. It used to say like the old 33 records played at 45. It's like a black CD. <laughs> They're coming back into fashion. <laughs> yes. Um, but also, you get very repetitive, a bit like the old stuck gramophone records. Yeah, calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down. Cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, come on, calm down, calm down. And then we'll offer 101 million things. Do you want an apple, a banana, a carrot, can I cook, cup of tea? Should we go out for a walk? Do you want to watch a video? <laughs> Explosion time. Yep. You just think of your own partners, past or present, where you've had a little bit of an argument and you turn around and your partner's saying to you, calm down. Cal shh, calm down. Calm down. How effective is that going to be with you? I don't think so. And yet, just listen to how often we say it to the individuals that are being supported. <coughs> yeah, probably far too frequent. It's amazing for me how often they will calm down. In fact, their control is better than ours because it wouldn't work for me in that situation. So, thinking about the, the communication in terms of our verbals, what about the non-verbals? And yeah, we may have the, the macatons and the like, and things getting bastardised, yeah, in terms of their own language. But the non-verbals from staff, what sort of non-verbals from staff do we have? Well, we'll have the classic. Mm. And we talk about open and closed body postures, don't we? Yes, closed are pretty bad, but you can have some pretty... Don't we? And then, of course, we'll compound the issue by having mixed messages. Take your time. Yeah. We've just got to be aware of what our body language is like. You know, what does it look like when people are tense? Yeah. Can we actually relax? When you get tense, your whole body tends to, to get bigger and when you're relaxed. You can do that. So we have are verbals and non-verbals to think about. I guess one of the elements and one of the key elements of low arousal is maybe we should listen to the person. Maybe they've got a justifiable gripe, a justifiable reason. If you think about your own partners, what are you going to be like if they don't listen to you? You're going to get a little miffed, aren't you? Can we actually listen to what the client is actually saying? Maybe if we can resolve what's worrying them, then we're going to resolve the instant without having to go hands-on, without being able to withdraw. Sometimes we can't resolve the situation there and then, but we may be able to distract. We may be able to distract the person onto another task. And what kind of distractors would people be thinking of using? What sort of things might you think you could use? Food. Yep, food. And, you know, food's a, an easy distractor, isn't it? We often, people use food and drink, fundamentals to human life, yeah, along with cigarettes, some would argue. Yeah, it's often an easy element. You don't really have to think about too much about food. It's often better to have other elements in play as well. Of course, the more you put into a person's life, the more distractors you're going to have. Other distractors could be the TV, DVD, video, a walk, for some people it could be washing up, yeah. for some people it may be a, a cycling or some sort of other physical activity, but you have to be able to have them to hand yeah, to know what it is. Now, the distractor is not the be and end all. It may well be that if it's a big enough problem, the person is going to come back to it. Yeah, I, I guess for you guys, if you've ever split up in a relationship, your friends take you to the pub to get you over it, you're in the bar, eight hours. Maybe for 30 minutes in the middle of it, you've forgotten about them. But then you come home. Of course, what do you think about? You're more morose than ever. 
yeah, about it. So it's only worked for a short length of time. Similarly for our clients, unless we actually resolve the initial situation, the individual may come back to it. The distractors that you do have, you have to have to hand. It's no good being out, crossing a road, client sits down in the middle of the road, you think, oh, really good distractors, a can of Coke. Ah, but where's my can of Coke? I know there's a shop 300 metres down the road, but I've got no change and it's closed on a Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, it would really have helped if I'd known that beforehand and have it available to me. What are the distractors? Can I put more into the person's life that they're going to enjoy so they'll actually have a, a, a better range of distractors? And if you've got a distractor, and you've got a distractor, and you've got a distractor, I should know all of them. Because your two might not have worked today, but yours would have done. Next, what I would consider is thinking about, can I remove the other people that are in the area, in the immediate environment? It doesn't really help when you have under in other individuals shouting out comments, you know, restrain him, restrain him, hit him, hit him, get him, get him, help. Yep. Those individuals may well have witnessed a fair degree of trauma in their own lives. If I can remove them and save them from further trauma, that's what I'm going to be trying to do. But people often say, well, that's very unfair, isn't it? Why should they move? They're not causing the problem. My um, argument to that would be, well, if it was a fire starting in the middle of the room, would you keep them there? We wouldn't, would we? We'd get them out because we know it's not safe. Unless you can guarantee their safety, Let's get them out. Give them some quality time somewhere else. Because often when you've removed the crowd, the client's more able to come down themselves anyway. But also it means that we're very much more focused on the individual we're supporting, not the other people around. The other things to think about is, can we talk? after the incident, can we talk about the incident, about our emotions, before we actually record it? The incident report is a legal document. It can end up in court with you. So it would really help if you are professional and the incident report is written uh, as an objective account, not an emotional, subjective one. If we're talking, yeah, can we debrief? Can we debrief, get rid of all those emotions first so that then we can actually write accurately what actually happened in that incident? Because that, that incident report will live with that client for a long time. It can be passed from one service to another service with them. And what's the first thing that staff see is this incident report. Yeah, let's at least give the client the benefit of having those incident reports as being accurate and not value laden judgmental in those terms. Does that make sense in terms of that? And when we're looking at the, the debriefing, um, I think it's essential that staff are debriefed yeah, prior to writing those incident reports. Otherwise, you'll see the debriefing down on paper. And I've seen things like, she pulled all my hair out. And you have to look at the person and think, well, hang on. You know, she may have pulled a clump of it out, she may pull it very hard, but unless that's a damn fine wig, she hasn't pulled it all out, has she? And then you go from one service to the next. A member of staff reads that report. They're expecting a the Tasmanian devil coming through the door. And often the realities are far from that kind of truth. That makes sense. I've kind of whizzed through low arousal, very quickly giving you an overview there. Are there any questions? We have. Go. Sorry, it's quite um, cultural. Yeah, I mean, the cultural elements, I think one of the things in terms of, and there are obviously cultural differences here, we're a very multicultural society. Um, it's interesting in terms of uh, a lot of people where they would be saying to clients, look at me, look at me when I'm talking to you. And of course, a lot of cultures, you wouldn't be looking at, uh, at your 
your elders, uh, you would be averting your eyes. So we're actually trying to get people to do something that they, you know, at home, yeah, they wouldn't be be taught to actually do. And I guess in terms of touch as well, you've got to be very much organisationally dependent on what you're actually able to do. So you have policies, procedures in place to say exactly what it is you are going to be doing, when you're going to be doing it, who is it going to be done with. So you know, you've got to be very careful. It's a, an element, isn't it, in terms of uh, for a lot of clients where we may uh, have a member of staff leaving and the staff are giving that, oh, it's good to hear you that hug at the end. But is that okay for the individual you're supporting to be doing that in McDonald's? You know, there's a lots of mixed messages that we will, will carry out. You, somebody's been on holiday for a couple of weeks, oh, it's good to see you back. Yeah, but when the client does it, no, no, that's not appropriate. And that's the difficulty when we're looking at it. Because for a lot of individuals, they won't pick up those social elements themselves. They have to be taught them. Yeah, the things that we take for granted they won't be able to actually pick up themselves. They just don't have it. And also, in one situation where it's appropriate, if they think it's appropriate to hug their mother, then they may well carry that on to somewhere else where it's appropriate to hug the, the lady in the street. Yeah, quite complicated. So, yeah. And I guess that's why we have individual care plans, individual behavioural support plans, that person-centred planning yeah, around the individuals. Any other questions? Because I think you've been the best group today. Okay. God, you should have seen the group in the last lecture. You know. <laughs> Sorry, is it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, a lot of the time, um, you're the cause of the problem. So sometimes, the, uh, you know, if, if staff take themselves and withdraw themselves, the person's able to calm down themselves. We often don't help the situation by being there. Sometimes they, when a, somebody, an individual goes into meltdown or shut down, yeah, they need that time to themselves. Yeah, without a doubt. Anything else? You're a very quiet group. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.